listening to the Pull List Podcast with Chris Poirier and Hector Murai, a bi-weekly show about how comics, pop culture, and faith affect culture at large. This is part of the Love Thy Nerd Podcast Network. Greetings, true believers, and welcome to episode nine of the Pull List Podcast. With me, as always, is the one and only Hector of the world-famous faith and fandom fame. Say hello, Hector. World famous. Say what? It, Hi. It's world famous. <laughs> it, Hello, people. North Carolina and adjacent famous? I don't know. I have some people that read stuff in Canada and uh, Asia. So that's nailed it. Internationally yep. famous Hector Faith and Fandom. I'm not internationally known, but I'm known to rock a microphone. Oh, so as many as you of you know, we are not alone on this magical journey of podcasts and fandom. We are actually part of the Love Thy Nerd podcast network, along with two other amazing podcasts. First, we have Humans of Gaming with Drew and Chris, which covers epic interviews with game designers, producers, and creators, and really gets to the heart of why those creators, those folks do what they do, and why do they enjoy it? And then we have Bubba, Matt, and Kate bring us the Free Play podcast, and that covers just about everything nerdy you can possibly imagine. And it's super fun. It's funny. Those folks are great. And you can check us all out on the lovethynerd.com. That's Dot on com. the interwebs. Right, exactly. And find other awesome content and other things as well. So I think that covers all of the business for the week, Hector. Let's get on with the show. So as we continue to grow, learn, mature, well, maybe not so much the mature part, but certainly as we grow and learn, Hector and I know that we'd like to try out new things and to see how they work. And so today we're going to be kind of mixing it up again from our usual format to prepare for some awesome things that may be coming in the near future. So spoilers, mark this date down. You should probably get some hype for episode 10 Because, Hector, uh, as you know, and we're going to tell the lovely people, we have our first creator interview coming in episode 10. Uh, We have all the pieces lined up, but we don't want to jinx it, so we're not going to tell you. So it's only a partial spoiler, but but yeah, go ahead. Just saying, this isn't like a, um, you know, discount creator. Just saying. Oh, no, no. We we want everyone to know in the Love Thy Nerd world that the Pull List podcast is... um, Slightly better than third rate, possibly second rate, but we're going top shelf for our first interview. So buckle up. It's going to be amazing. So we've probably hyped it more than we should already, but prepare for episode 10. We're really looking forward to bringing all of you our first interview, but let's talk about kind of what's going on in comics uh, right now. And we wanted to bring you guys some news that we kind of covered some industry news in our last episode when we talked about stuff going on at DC. And some of you folks said, hey, we kind of enjoyed finding out some stuff about comics, what's going on. And so we wanted to bring some of that to you right at the top of the show this time around. And just kind of looking over the news wires, you know, uh, doing my internet googly searches. Um, there's a few things that kind of stood out to me and Hector, I'll see if there's anything that jumps out to you. But the one thing that jumped out to me this week that was kind of unfortunate is for all those fans of doomsday clock. Number nine is still slipping into the ether yet again, that doomsday clock kind of got plagued early with the every other month schedule, even not even monthly um, with Jeff Johns writing that nine slipped a month. And now the date's just gone and disappeared. Um, are so we looking at like kind of, an all-star Batman situation here? Is like we're hoping not because we're yeah we're also reaching the end of this story. It's a twelve-part series, but um, for yeah, those of you who don't know, All-Star Batman with Frank Miller and Jim Lee got to what the tenth book out of twelve and just stopped and was there never was, picked up. There was, yeah, there was so much interesting and strange going on with All-Star Batman. Um, because with the teams changing almost monthly on that book, which was kind of the point all star that they did bring lots of different talent each time, but doomsday clock was the set team from the beginning and has a story to tell. So not really sure what's going on there, but fans of watching what Jeff was doing and giving us our actual sequel to the Watchmen, we're, we're just going to have to wait a little longer. Well, um, we might be on that whole situation where the HBO show comes out before we get this book. That's actually the <laughs> end of 
that that's actually the end of Doomsday Clock. They never intended to give us the rest of the story. It just turns into an HBO miniseries. Surprise. Oh, no. You heard it here oh, first. Write, yeah, write that down. He might be right. Um, <laughs> while we're talking about DC, the other thing that kind of stepped up, and I think we talked about it last time, but another uh, DC omnibus in trade has been canceled. And for those that have been paying <sighs> attention, we found out that uh, Hush Omnibus got canceled. This one was a Batgirl that no one's really sure why DC seems to be backing away from these omnibus collections going to print, but there's been a handful announced in the last couple of weeks. So for those of you that I don't know, I'm personally omnibus- one of the people that buys these, like right. I'll buy single issues. I'll buy graphic novels. And if you turn around and make an omnibus or a, as DC was calling them, the absolute editions um, mm-hmm. for a long time, I, I have a shelf about three feet wide of just these hardback absolute editions. And, uh, I will keep buying them and y'all didn't lost some money. So just say it. Yeah. So we've mentioned this before that for those that are a little uninitiated and they're getting used to comics as they explore with us, uh, trades are typically going to be, you know, four to five single issues collected in a book. And it's usually a story arc. And a lot of folks read that way because they can get the entire story after it's completed, as opposed to having to wait month to month for a floppy or a single issue. Omnibus are usually massive collections that are either going to be a complete threaded story. Sometimes they will actually be um, 20 to 30. Sometimes if they're smaller issues, 50 issues completely pieced together. So you can literally read one to two to sometimes more years worth of content all the once. And they usually throw extras in there like sketch yep. covers and some of the art and give you some Alt- background from alternative editorial. pages. There's a lot of stuff. Yeah. And they're really cool collections, but um, unfortunately we're missing out on hush and Batgirl new 52 era stuff for whatever reason. Uh, we just think it's kind of noteworthy because DC seems to have been pulling some of those really close to their release dates. Um, hush was like, a month or two away from hitting shelves and it just disappeared. Um, So it's something to keep an eye on. It's one of those trends in the publishing business that usually there's a reason, but for the moment we just have indicators and we don't really know what's up. But I thought Hector, you might find that interesting that your, your hush glory is not alone. DC apparently is doing this to a lot of their lines in that omnibus collectible stuff. Well, I'm selfish and I really only care about what I want. So Mm. (laughs) So, so Hector's not loving the DC news for today. So, uh, I, I wanted, I wanted to be fair in balancing the news, um, as we try this, this conversation piece out. And I don't know if you saw it. I just literally saw it before we sat down is Marvel did release the runtime on Avengers Endgame. And once again, will be their longest theatrical release to date. So much so. Marvel is testing with audiences an intermission to this movie. Jeez. I'll let that I'll let that settle in. We're on we're on we're on straight blown Titanic levels here. Like Yeah. I, what's I, the actual runtime? I mean, that's the thing. I, I know I think I'm gonna have to double googly that. Um, but that tells me that's north of three hours. Yeah, it has to be north of three. Let, let's also note in news that uh, I think since our last podcast, Aquaman became DC's highest grossing film of all time. That uh, for whatever insanity, Jason Momoa's abs, um, that movie <laughs> has become a higher seller than The Dark Knight or The Dark Knight Rises. And, you know, personally, I believe The Dark Knight was the best of the trilogy and I think it's the best thing DC's ever put out. And the idea that I Aquaman agree. makes more than that just makes me sad in my soul. I'm happy for DC. You know, we can make up some of that Justice League money, but um, yeah, no, nah, that's that's bananas. And uh, like, I had a friend, one of the people that go to my church, who stopped by our house on her third trip to see Aquaman, and I'm like, oh, it's that kind of party. She's like, yes, yes, it is. Uh, 
<laughs> Magic Mike of the Sea or oh sorry something different. And let's well no, okay for the record I know you still haven't seen it. Um, I, that is and, that is absolutely accurate. And the, it is so much less smoldery than you anticipate until you watch it. It's a straight up sci fi adventure. I mean it wasn't it wasn't the smoldering tuna of the sea. That's not what was happening. I mean, that's, he was. That's good. I, that's what I've heard a lot of folks say. To be completely fair, and I'm definitely going to make that adventure soon because of that. Because that makes me happy. To be, I honest. mean, it, it is straight up. It is Thor and Killmonger and Star Wars underwater. The end. That's the whole movie. Um, that's what it is. I'd, I'd see. I'd see that movie for a dollar. Right. Um, and what? What's maybe cracks more me than up, a dollar? This. Um, to be the highest grossing DC film of all time, it's the first DC film I've only seen in theaters once. Oh, interesting. Right, because for those of you that don't know, Hector, when he partakes in a movie, he will definitely go as early as possible with his family to be able to take the, in the very, the comic the very, book very first Thursday at 7 show. Yeah. He does not mess around. He puts me incredibly to shame when it comes to making it to the movie theater for a lot of these things. And if it's even remotely on the level, he's going to go once to twice more to thoroughly absorb the masterpiece as it is. Like how many times did you see spider verse? Um, I've seen it at least three. See, um, I, I figured that would be a good barometer in the middle of this because that was a really good movie. Now on the flip side, I saw justice league three times. Um, so you you um, did enjoy Justice League, though. I remember no, you saying that and you can well, be here, loud and proud about that here. We are very equal opportunists. I know. I know show. it's not up to standards of other hero movies. And there was all the debacle of what it looked like to have Whedon and Snyder literally fighting in front of the kids at the dinner table. Um, but <laughs> you're not. It wrong. Was, I, I get everything that was wrong with it. But that's the first time we've had. Flash, Aquaman, Wonder Woman, Batman, and Superman on the big screen. I get, I'm going to watch that. Um, yep. And I there was a lot I enjoyed. But anyway, I, I, can, I can ramble. But right. uh, the fact is DC put out their most successful movie, which is going to shape the game of how these movies move forward. Um, I've got a lot of hope for Shazam. I have a man crush on Zachary Levi. Always have since the first episode of Chuck. Yep. Cannot um, wait for Shazam. I'm, I'm in. Um, I bought my first Shazam action figure this week. It was fun. Um, Did you get the dual pack that came out? That it was not on the shelves. But uh, once I get back, oh, I'm, I'm going on a trip this week, and once I get back, I'm going to rearrange my action figure shelf, and I'm going to put Eugene from Tangled and Shazam high fiving, and so I can have a Zachary Levi paradox on my shelf. It's going to happen. I'd say you have a problem, but actually, that sounds quite glorious. So I'll allow it. Um, so, yeah, so DC crushes at the box office with Aquaman this week. And to answer the question, yeah, Marvel is clocking Avengers Endgame at exactly three hours. That's not that bad. It's not that bad, but I will be interested to see what they come out of a play test with in terms of showing audiences that long of a movie and what they think. I hope to be honest at three hours, I hope they don't put an intermission in it. Cause that's going to feel weird. Um, but, but I mean, the problem isn't the three hour movie. The problem is the 25 minutes of credits and stuff before it or trailers <laughs> and stuff before it. That's absolutely fair. That's a good point. But, Cause, Cause this is going to be at a, like three and a half. That puts you at a solid three and a half. So if you do that plus a 15 minute intermission, all of a sudden we're banking on four hours here. Cause guess what? You're going to stay till after Oof. the credits. It's a Marvel movie. <laughs> right so no, that's... You're, lo you're looking at a solid four hours if you add an intermission i'd rather not i can hold it Oof. it's okay <laughs> so to recap for you guys this week doomsday clock nine <laughs> slips into the ether uh marvel avengers endgame can't wait to see it but three three and a half three hours of runtime three and a half with everything else possibly an intermission DC's taken all those omnibus for some reason back into the ether that is the publishing magnificent wonder house that they are. And Aquaman crushes it on the world stage and gets paid. So there's always going to be a bunch of stuff going on in comics. And we're honestly going to try our scouts on our best to bring each and every new scout. thing. 
<laughs> yeah, as see, we're, I wasn't see? lying. Um, I was a Cub Scout. I didn't what yeah, you know. I, I made it so, to boy, but not much further. There you go. So, a Scout's honor um, Scout's that we're going to try to bring you the most up to date on what's going on in the industry and what's going on in the wires. So you can kind of feel what's going on, what we see um, from our level, from doing conventions and also just being plugged into the retail space. So you could be in the know. Um, so stay tuned for updates from your friendly neighborhood podcasters here on the pull list podcast, as we give you news and updates, hopefully each and every episode. But for today, we want to spend a bunch of time talking about a topic that I think Hector and I promised you three or four episodes ago. So kind of like Tom King and Batman um, lines of thought, like nightmares that we're not going to get to revisit for like another four issues, but save it for the podcast. We'll talk about that later. Um, yep. We want to talk about conventions and community and what really makes the comic book community kind of unique, how we spend our time at conventions, why we enjoy doing conventions, because we think that all of that is really important to comics. Isn't just reading the books, right? It's, it's actually about being part of a fandom that is larger than just the content, but it's the people it's, it's Hector. It's myself. It's those around us. And those that come into comic shops every Wednesday morning, in my case at eight in the morning, we open at 8 AM. So people can literally get their books as soon as possible when they come out and what we love so much about this. So, Hector, you've been doing conventions for a while now. So I yeah. think I want to get your take on A, what brought you into the space to begin with? And then we can kind of go from there. Okay. Um, my first convention was about a decade ago. Um, God, Lee G. Batman, that's a long time. Um, it was about a decade ago. And. Um, I am not a professional wrestling fan. It's not like a thing in my life per se, but I was a hardcore fan of professional wrestling in the late nineties up until like 2000. And, um, a friend of mine who read comic books, uh, invited me to my first con. It was heroes con about a decade ago. And, uh, told me that Mick Foley, which is a classic, wwe f wrestler um yeah i know that guy and yeah I, i'm the same it's like okay um i i was a big mick foley fan like uh i worked in a bookstore when his first book have a nice day came out and my my bookstore gave me clearance to dress in a full mankind mick foley costume for like three weeks so are there I liter- photos from that there are photos from that um and oh. you know what's funny? I have a photo of me dressed like mankind signed by Mick Foley. So that's a thing. Um, and because I told him about my book experience. But so I, I went to my first Comic-Con without any knowledge of it, of what it looked like. And um, ended up going to the biggest con in the Carolinas uh, easily at that point in time. And you know, just kind of fell in love with it, fell in love with the culture, fell in love with seeing cool people in costumes and uh, fell, just fell in love with it. We spent two or three days at this event um, and it was I had been an avid reader at that point for about six years again. I'd, I'd taken a comic book hiatus and I'd been a really hardcore reader for six or seven years when I finally got to this point. And um it just amazed me that I was able to walk up and in almost every case at that point in time, get comic books signed by a major artist for free and to stand there and talk to them. Like um, my first show, Tim sale of, you know, long Halloween and, you know, these epic stories that like movies like the dark Knight were based on, like signed stuff for free and even drew me a doodle like, and you know, I got, I was hush is one of my favorite stories and I got to meet some of the creative teams behind hush's second story arc. I got to, you know, meet Mark Bagley from Spider-Man or Bagley, however you say it. Um, and you know, the guy who drew a hundred issues of Spider-Man straight and ultimate. And he did decades of that before. I meant literally getting to meet all these people was, just astonishing to me. And I loved it. And then, so that was my first year. Well, my next year I wanted to cosplay. 
um, because I I saw the community got I got a hunger and a thirst for it, and so the next year I you guessed it dressed like Hush. Um, my wife spent weeks sewing me a full blown legit Hush costume. I went, I did the cosplay thing, and then right after that was when um I had gotten the idea that I could be a part of this on a permanent scale and be an artist alley and write faith and fandom. And so that next year following that was like, okay, I'm going to start doing this. Um, I had actually, I think my last time just being an attender was cause here's the funny thing. I didn't go to any shows, but heroes con until I started vending in artist alley. Um, sure. Like I just didn't, I didn't know where any other shows were. This was the only show this dude went to that I was friends with. And, um, you know, I, I said on the last, my last summer going to that show as a civilian, um, I just looked around and thought, man, there's some stuff I can do here. My, my voice is not in this place right now. The voice that I identify is not with this, like that merger of faith and comics and geek culture. That's just not there. It's like, I can be that voice. And so, you know, I spent that, you know, next six months writing and literally for the last six years since then, um, I've been in comic cons. Like I've been going to about 28 a year and, um, I love it, man. Like, I love it so much. Uh, It's a lot of work. Some of these shows have stupid long hours. Um, Yeah, they do. (laughs) I did. I did one show in Virginia that literally went from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. on the con floor. Um, And it was bananas. But here's the thing. I love it. Like, it's so hard work driving a car full of books and equipment and hauling butt across states moving all this stuff on a little hand truck through convention centers and sitting there for three days on end. And I mean, there's a lot of work to it, but there is just something so fun about being in a place where you can passionately connect with people about other things that you're passionate about and be open about the things that you love and, you know, and that you can create and interact with other creators regardless of how, you feel about different things. I mean, I've just really loved the culture and, um, you know, it's, it's become family. I I straight up have people in my life that, you know, have become family to me and my, and to my family and in my ministry and stuff because of that. I mean, you and I met that way. Um, and so it's, it's become for the last six years, it's become like, about 30 to 40 percent of what i do on a ministry and creative side um i have to still be a pastor like because that pays you my bills every everybody's got the day job everybody's got the day job i have a cool day job my day job you know is awesome and i get to love people and you know teach and lead and everything but my day job also hired me my my the church that hired me as a pastor knew that i was going to have to spend at least five weekends out of the year gone for comic cons and they were cool with it so i meant comic cons were built into hiring me which was nice so yeah how about you so what's your what's your what got you involved well that's what's kind of funny was i was i guess i was a quiet nerd through most of my professional career because for folks that don't know my story i did not start a ministry um I worked for the U.S. federal government as a contractor and as a civilian employee for almost eight years and then got the call to go to seminary, moved to North Carolina and really left that part of my professional life behind me. And kind of in that transition, I had free time back in my life. Um, the The D.C. Beltway kind of absorbs a lot of your time in just existence. Um, and I wasn't going to the movies I enjoyed. I I was barely reading comics at the time because I just didn't have the time. And coming to North Carolina, which my wife grew up here, so we had family here, so I had people I knew, I kind of fell into finally enjoying the things I wasn't able to have in my life before. And same thing, I went to, the funny part about this, and 
as Hector already said, was my first convention was actually the convention I met Hector at. <laughs> um, that that wasn't just the first time I met Hector. It was the first time I wandered into this thing called a comic book convention. And I immediately, just like Hector, I immediately fell in love with what was around me of literally everyone inside the walls of that convention is happy to be there. And our fandoms could be so disparate from one another, but also still connected just by the reality of we're so excited about the stuff that's in front of us. And that just blew my mind. And then, you know, I was a year or so in the seminary at the time and then meeting someone like you that was like, wait, I, I could do both of these things at the same time. And really be able to love on people and love the things that I love. Like my mind was physically blown um, because the same experience also taught us this weird thing that a lot of folks have experienced at conventions of, unfortunately there's usually protesters like straight up protesters or a street preacher, usually screaming at the people going to a convention. Um, you you're worshiping your false gods, um, wasting your time on all these falsehoods and putting your faith in these super humans. You're that making don't even it exist. sound as, as gross as that sounds, you're making it sound way too polite. Um, I, I know <laughs> I was because, trying to be polite because most of these guys are top. I mean, even if they mean toxic. well, yeah, yes. even if they mean well, their attitudes toxic and very unchristlike. And I've, I've had people come to my panels or come to my booth and literally seek refuge or counsel because of yes. how emotionally abused they felt by the people outside of the walls. So, I and mean, what, that, go ahead. Yeah. What that experience did for me was, I think, similar to what you were saying, is it gave me an opportunity to say, I want to be part of this because look at the joy that folks are taking from it look at the reality that there are people of faith in this space. Some of them might not be wearing it on their sleeves, but there's a lot of creators that they, they go to church on Sunday and that's not weird for them. Um, for a culture that seems to typically not be of any form of faith, um, there's actually a fair number of us that are part of that community. And as you said, we're, we're family with folks from all over the spectrum of different faith to no faith that we're friends. When we go to Comic-Con, we're friends. When we talk about comics that it's, there's a saying within comics and comic cons in general of that comics are for everyone. And the reason I share that is because it's one of the few places I've witnessed, especially in the last decade that I believe that is true that Hector and I both have done faith in comics or God in comics type panels at conventions that are attended. And usually they're attended by a cross section of folks, certainly folks that know we're in town and want to hear what we have to say to believers that are interested in what this actually looks like to people that just want to know what on earth we're actually going to talk about. Um, and I found that fascinating through all of my relationships that not only do we get this opportunity to collectively enjoy our hobbies together to put it ever so simply. Um, but also that we can be who we are and that it's in a space that is usually going to come without any form of judgment that people are honestly, yeah, we're all fans. It's the thing that brought us here. So you can't be all evil. You still like Dr. Who, right? You know, that kind of thing. Um, that that's what I've always enjoyed. And so we've been talking about the comic um, convention type atmosphere I then took that with me into the retail environment as an employee where people come into the comic book store each and every day with their fandom to find the thing that they want to read or something new that's similar or just to find something new because they appreciate the medium that is comics. And kind of like my weekend job of being a pastor as well, I get to talk to people about what interests them, what types of things they're looking for, what types of stories they're looking for. And you can learn a lot about people through the types of things they're either escaping from in what they're reading or things that they want to relate to by reading certain stories that this is one of the most intimate ways I feel that you can really interact with other people because this type of fandom really gets to the heart of things that they enjoy. They dislike even, but how they are spending their time and a lot of their money to be honest, which means a great deal of energy goes into their existence in 
reading these things and being part of this fandom, which I think is incredibly powerful. What you choose to entertain yourself with does say a lot about you. And that's honestly like one of the things when I do, I do a faith and fandom panel, which is different than my geek church service. Geek church service is straight up a, a church service with geeky Bible studies and stuff. Um, but the faith and fandom panel is honestly just discussing, you know, why you feel like you have to hide what you're involved in, why you have to feel like you can't do both. And um, so, you know, I try to really help people to see that, you know, if you have to hide the stuff you're into, it's probably, you know, a toxic environment. It's not probably good for you. You probably need to be able to be real with yourself and those things. And so I've got to really just speak some life into people who were afraid to get anywhere near God or faith or Christians because they thought that meant checking everything about who they were at the door and to show them, you know, <laughs> you, you really can, you know, see light and love and faith and everything else in these things together. And, you know, it's, it's just been really neat. The responses I've gotten. One of the crazy things is like people like you, I meet a lot of pastors or Christian leaders or people of faith that, you know, feel like they have no anchor in this world or that they have no business enjoying these things. And, you know, I've got the, I've had pastors come and meet with me. Um, I've had youth ministers and things like that come and hit me up. It's just been really neat um, with that capacity. But honestly, my favorite things is uh, in a lot of ways, the artist alley family that I've got to meet and work with in a lot of ways, I've become like their chaplain or mm -hmm. yep, absolutely. Um, there are people who I only know from comic cons that will have me, will call me to pray for them or, you know, that we've done marriage counseling with, or that I've, you know, will help them through some stuff emotionally and spiritually. And it's just been neat to with that. But I mean, when, anytime I go to a comic con now, you know, celebrities aren't the big draw anymore. It's I get to go hang out with my friends. Um, it it can be true. It can be truly amazing because I've been the same way. The last few shows that I've been to is if I'm there for work, which is usually why I'm there. Um, I spend a day just catching up with people, like not even like buying stuff because I can easily spend money on original art and supporting the people that I enjoy. But I think the last time it took me almost the entire first day just to catch up with the number of people I'd become friends with. And I keep telling people it, everyone down to the fan level can have that relationship. It's exactly what Hector was saying at the beginning of this conversation is a lot of these folks are so approachable because they are just people like the rest of us. They have an unbelievably amazing gift, many of them, in either art or writing, but they love sharing that experience. So I always tell people, just talk to a lot of these folks. You know, get your signature. You absolutely should support them and, and fan out a little bit. But a lot of these folks are just like you and I, and they have life going on, and they're more than happy to talk about some of the things that they're working on or the things that they're going through because people don't generally treat them just like people, which is kind of unfortunate and seems simple. But I often definitely tell folks that if you want to get in to this, it's just ask questions, you know, for an artist, you know, it's like what you're working on and all that kind of stuff. They're used to that. You should ask those questions, but what are you reading? That isn't your work. Some of that can tell you a lot about some of these creators and what drives them. And some of them will be happy to gush on their fandom because they're all fans too. It's just yeah. such a neat community. And, you know, while we're talking on comic creators and artists and celebrities and things like that, another aspect of the community that is one of my favorites are cosplayers. Um, oh yeah. Cosplayers literally in, in the six years I've been doing faith and fandom have become a staple. When I was starting, even just six or seven years ago, it was still sort of a fringe thing. Um, the first show I went to, Heroes Con, um, they weren't even doing a cosplay contest when I started. Um, I literally no, was it's doing definitely a, become a thing. 
Yeah, I was I was doing a web show at that point in my last year as a civilian. I walked around and filmed all the cosplayers and gave out prizes. I was, you know, giving <laughs> giving out prizes to cosplayers and then that became a thing, but like I've these some of these cosplayers that put this effort into it, they do it because they love the comics and they love the stories and they love the characters and just talking with them and appreciating their work has been Really cool. I have a, a whole group of people that I only interact with as cosplayers. And it's just been really Same. neat. So I mean, they're just they're a very tight a, community. They're a very tight community. And, you know, I I like having the reputation, even among the cosplayers that don't agree with me ideologically, that I'm someone safe to talk to and cool to talk to. So no, absolutely. Neat. And it, it strikes me that we didn't really, we sort of talked about what cosplay means, but cosplay, what we're talking about for folks that might not know is actually the Muggles. folks that, right, yeah, <laughs> that make their costumes uh, or buy them, that there's a lot of discussions within that community about what a true cosplayer is. But the point of the minimum point is that these are fans that want to create costumes, dress as some of their favorite characters and attend conventions. Some of them do so for contest purposes because there are contests now like Hector was talking about in terms of uh, best construction, you know, sewing. It's a craft inside of a craft, basically. And some people do it just to have fun and to dress up like the cool people that they want to for a weekend and not be looked at funny. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's some of the best part about conventions um, that I know – my mom has been attending the last couple shows because she's like, I don't get it. She is now in love with cosplay contests because of it. Cause she's like, that is amazing. I'm like, it is, it truly is. I will straight up attend a show or not attend a show based on who's going to cosplay there. <laughs> like, yeah. It's a thing. So it's a uh, yeah, pro tip. Um, once you get to meet some cosplayers and find the organizations that you enjoy, you can find out a lot about a show. Um, value to a particular community based on which cosplayers and or organizations are actually in attendance. That's a great pro tip. So there's just so much to this community conversation to pack into an episode, but Hector and I um, were always open to have those conversations with folks. There's also a lot of different ways you can get involved in the comics community in general. And that includes even at your local comic book store. And I'll, I'll save you the time now, um, but by the time this <laughs> podcast comes out, uh, I actually will have an article uh, that will now be available. You should be able to click it in the notes that I give kind of my top five recommendations on how you can, if you have trying to figure out how do, how do I get involved? How can I help? How can I engage this community through my local comic shop? Uh, I have gifted upon you um, words of grandeur or words anyway. Um, like that the lady hopefully- in the lake. Gave King yeah, his sword. it's it's really not a good form of government, but that's an entirely different conversation. <laughs> but um, you sh- can check out the show notes for some great ways to be able to engage your local comic shop because it's a great way to find out what's going on, to get engaged, and then also just how to love on your local comic shop because everybody needs some love in the world today. And um, as, as I mentioned in my article a couple weeks ago, there is literally almost certainly a comic con happening within three hours of you almost every weekend. Yep. Like, no, absolutely. That if if you are willing to travel two to three hours, you can find a comic con almost every weekend. So don't, don't think they only exist in San Diego once a year, wherever you live outside of Alaska. Um, (laughs) <laughs> There's probably it's valid a comic con within three hours of you every weekend. So just look it up. Yep, look it up. And the best part about some of those local and regional shows is it's not going to cost a lot of money either. Or what's even better is a lot of shows, especially the larger they get, they're seeking volunteers. And if you volunteer, most of them will give you passes to that show. So there's lots of ways for you to get in that. If money's an issue, that's a great way to get involved in to find out what's going on. So it's an amazing community. It's hard to almost define, but hopefully this conversation has helped some folks kind of figure out what that community looks like, which is a lot. Um, and what that really means to folks because there, there's just so much that can do. So Chris, as we, Yo, oh, I know, I know we're about to magically segue. What's your <laughs> favorite, what's your favorite comic con that you've been to that you didn't work for? Oof. 
Um, oh, right. That I didn't work for. Okay. I got it. Work for. Yep. Um, <laughs> honestly, to date, um, I think my favorite show was Baltimore. Um, Baltimore was the largest show that I had attended um, at the time. But also that particular show just had an amazing cross section of new super hot. Oh my goodness. They're so hot right now. Creators to legends that I, I just didn't know what to do with myself. Um, but the reason that particular show kind of stuck for me was I sought out, uh, Marv Wolfman, um, at, cause that was the first time I was going to be at a show that he was available at. And Marv is old school writer, um, gave us all kinds of amazing things, but most specifically he's known for teen Titans, like the beginning, the, um, yeah, the Titans. He, Right. Gave us, gave us blade, um, and a lot of other cool stuff, but Marv's been around a while, um, and has written some absolutely amazing stories. And I got to sit and talk with him for about 45 minutes. Cause I hit him early cause he showed up early to set up himself. He didn't have handlers or anything like that. He, <laughs> he does his own thing. Get um, him. yeah. Um, and so I offered to help him set up and he's like, no, no, but if you want to sit and talk, absolutely. And we just had it. I was just fanboying the entire time, but such a humble person that's done some very cool things that is also amazing at talking nonstop. <laughs> but trust me, if you're a fan of any of these things, creators like that are such a cool opportunity to sit and talk to. You. And then the, the cherry on that, Sunday was come the last day of the con. Um, I think it was his daughter um, lived in the area or travels with him occasionally. Um, and I was wearing a Firefly shirt and she's like, oh, cool. Brown coat. And I was like, yeah. And I was like, you know, some of the anchors and the colorists from the original Dark Horse comic run are here. And she stopped and went, there's a comic. And I was like, oh, sweetie. I'm about to blow your mind. <laughs> and I told her the entire existence of the Whedon verse at dark horse. And, you know, Carl story was there and um, some of the other folks that had done work. And I was like, yeah, he's got some stuff at his table. Um, they're really, Carl's a great anchor and he's a great person as well. I enjoyed talking to him at that show. Um, and, and Marv was like, what, what's a what? And I was like, oh, this is great because I got to watch his daughter attempt to explain <laughs> uh, Firefly to him. Um, and he was like, cool. <laughs> um, and she's like, I will be right back. And I was like, good move. But yeah, um, that is what I love about shows. But I also got to see people that I had met through a bunch of other shows. And that was a show I got to catch up with a ton of folks at. Yeah. And that was the first time that I really got to experience that, that I was like, it is worth my investment. Every show I go to, to catch up with people I see, I, I don't know why I have this analogy in my head, but the analogy I usually use is I feel like it must've been what the circus was like back in the day that, Oh yeah. Straight that was up. on that, right. That was on that consistent circuit of travel that people like remembered you from the last time you were there. That so what you're saying is all the comic book artists are carnies. I'm trying really not to make that analogy, <laughs> but it's that concept that all of us literally travel city to city. None of us actually live in the same place, but so much, so many of us have seen each other weekend to weekend. And it's because the show that brought us there. That's great. Um, and so as a result of that, I have a ton of really amazing friendships. Um, and that's what I look forward to as we go to cons, um, you know, with love thy nerd, I'll give them the real quick pitch here. We're going to our first comic convention as love thy nerd. We're going to Phoenix, uh, fan fusion at the end of May that I've been constantly clicking refresh on the guest list to see who I'm going to be able to blow their mind. I'm in Arizona. Cause I usually don't leave the East coast. Um, so I've it's going to be really there that I would love to see. I'm actually, when is that show? It's uh, uh, 24th through the 26th, 27th. It's the oh, end of July. the month. Okay. Uh, May. May. Oh, ew. okay. I'm actually <laughs> driving. I'm driving there in July or August. Um, so, so yeah, this, this community thing is, is, is real and it's really amazing of what it can all be. So 
you know, check out Love Thy Nerd for articles on that. Hector and I are trying to crank out some more stuff so you can kind of read what that community and what engagement looks like for us. Um, but we just wanted to share a little bit here. And as you can see, we, we were able to talk a fair amount about it because it's something it's why we're here. It's literally why we enjoy doing this thing. Yes. So as we as we wrap up the episode for this week, kind of what we're part of our new ism is. Uh, we've heard some folks say that they love our conversation on what we're pulling and everything, but maybe it's a little long. So we're going to try to give you guys a more concise, um, what we're po- <laughs> right. <laughs> um, what we're pulling and what we enjoyed week to week and why, so you can head out and grab those things. So Hector, as we wrap up episode speed nine, run. it's, it's the speed run, but not too, too bad, but what'd you pull and why should folks check it out? Okay, pulled the Teen Titans annual because Red Robin versus or Red Hood versus Damian Wayne worth that. Um, I'm enjoying the progress and Heroes in Crisis. Um, I've been slightly so surprised at people talking about it's the worst book ever made. Like I don't think they see what's going on. To no, be absolutely honest. Like that I, might I have, have to be a topic for us because I I feel like there's a huge gotcha coming and I'm pretty yes. impressed by the setup. Yeah, and that's the thing. You see the gotchas in books, but I talk I'm talking to people that I know are as at as many comic cons as I am saying it's the worst book they've ever seen. And I'm like, you're special. Um <laughs> I checked out Fight Club three number volume three number one. Don't know yep. if I'm gonna keep going, or I might wait until it's in a trade. Um that's fair. It it can be it can be a difficult read because did you read Fight Club 2 when it came out? I read it as a trade. Okay. So it's still the continuation of the story, but the story is you know, Chuck writes a really weird story to begin with, but if they were to make two and now three into a movie, I think some people would that they would not know what this is. <laughs> oh no. You, I two Fight Club 2 is not translatable. Like as weird right. as one was, it's not. Um, Two ma- was off the wall. Yeah, straight bananas. Um, I finished out Daredevil Man without, or not Daredevil, just Man Without Fear. I was very impressed by that whole run. I appreciated it. Um, that's actually one of my favorite Daredevil stories. It's only five issues. If you don't read anything else of Daredevil, that's worth picking up. Marvel Knights, super not happy. Um, <laughs> I I honestly let it go at issue three because it kind of seemed to me it just was not going anywhere. Oh, bro. It got to issue six and it's like, hey, we had a vague idea while eating a toaster strudel and drew it on a napkin. And that's as far as the development went. Um, And that's about where it's at. Pretty artwork. I like some quotes, but man, it felt like this was a 24 arc or 24 issue story arc that they put in six issues. Sad I spent money on it. Um, uh, The first or the new Batman written by the dude that's not Tom King. (laughs) I should know his name. Nope. This is important. Um, And I'll, I'll hit it now, but it's Joshua Williamson. Joshua is the current writer on the flash. Uh, We are entering a four part crossover again between Batman and flash. I was going to go Batman flash, Batman flash. And Tom King announced a few months ago that he was handing it off to Williamson because he had a super secret project, I think TV project explicitly yes. that he was working on. So he was taking a break, but he was leaving it in the hands of Williamson, who's been the Flash writer because it's a crossover and that's where we're at. Yeah, and here's the thing. It was solid. I had no beef with it. I knew it wasn't Tom, but I didn't have a problem. It's definitely still worth reading. Um, I also, based on your recommendation from last week, picked up Flash Annual. Um, enjoyed that. Uh, I got to say my surprise favorite of the week or of the of this time we've been reading was the current issue of Harley Quinn. I want to say it's fifty eight. Um, it's a Batman Harley Quinn team up. Yep, and it's great. Uh, it's just a pure. I don't. You don't have to pick up any other issues of Harley Quinn if you just want a really fun Batman Harley Quinn experience. Harley Quinn number fifty eight, totally worth it. Um, Immortal Hulk number thirteen, really solid payoff. Uh, I can say this, this 13 issues of Immortal Hulk were fantastic. I would buy it in a hardback and just own the whole thing. Um, it's ju- I'd say it's just a hair under Mr. Miracle as a complete story. Nice. Um, not, not worse than Mr. Miracle's hair under, but then uh, my favorite read 
and I think it's just because it's taken so long to get around, is uh, My Hero Academia Volume 17 dropped. Yep. Um, read the whole book in one sitting. Um, and I feel like the My Hero Academia folks have it set on an annual calendar to screw with our hearts and emotions once a year in February. Um, I have a feeling if you go back and look at the way the volumes have dropped consecutively, this is exactly one year since the All Might one or All for One fight with the Now It's Your Turn. Oh, wow. So this this is exactly one year since that issue dropped or since that volume dropped. And without spoilers, I feel like we get the next level equivalent of that in this one. Um, and I really need to catch up on that series and I'm way behind. Um, like the whole, you, you know, remember that whole uh, muscular Deku fight? Like yeah. the yep. emotional intensity of it. It's that emotional intensity combined with All Might's now it's your turn all in a new story. All, had me all in my feels. Totally worth reading. So My Hero Academia Volume 17. So that's what I've read over the last two weeks. Boom. So again, I guess I'll start at the top with uh, Batman 64 with uh, Williamson at the helm. Uh, there's like that book just opened with a punch to the face and I won't get into it because, yes. you know, I think we I think we've mentioned it in the Heroes in Crisis stuff, but I don't want to get to the spoiler because it's all over the Internet and fine. But if you're following Heroes in Crisis, you do need to read Heroes in Crisis. You do need to read Flash Annual number two. And then the price obviously is going to be very important to the Rebirth arc, but also explicitly to what's going on at Heroes in Crisis, which now tells me because it's crossing into the Batman arc this way in the middle of Tom's story that the outcome of Heroes in Crisis is going to matter to Rebirth. Um, well, I mean, but I mean, you've been dealing with that with Red Hood. Yep, and uh, that's been in every book. It's been in t- the Titans Annual. It's been in Green Arrow. It's been in Flash. It's been in Batman. We're not getting away from Heroes in Crisis. No. So, so it- if you thought that you can go, oh, this was terrible, it's very clear that this is very much designed to be a major, significant event. We're used to hearing the, oh, everybody's dead, but I'm starting to think that they're not kidding anymore. That. Um, I think there is a, a gotcha coming and I can't wait to see it. But even within this issue of Batman 64, where the issue ended tying us all the way back to the very first story arc that Tom wrote, um, a, that made me go, man, to be honest, I've been telling people not to read that story arc cause it wasn't great and it hadn't come back up yet. Well, now it's come up again. And I'm like, well, shoot, dude, I loved <laughs> that story arc. The I am Gotham. I love that one. Yeah, I, I felt like I just wasn't in the Tom yet, and maybe that's part of it. But now that I see that much like Bane pulling from the different pieces in this story, that clearly this one's going to matter as well. And to well, see that it's just going it's, back, this yeah. reveal in this issue, this same character was in Batman 50. Mm-hmm. Yep. No, and that's why we're we're now starting to see the pieces of all the different people that were connected to Bane and the Cabal and whatever he's planning. So uh, kudos to Williamson to literally picking up a story that isn't his, continuing to make it relevant, and I'm excited to see what he does with the rest of the crossover because I've enjoyed him writing Flash. Um, and he's also just a really neat dude, um, really down to earth. Um, I had a pleasure of meeting him a year ago and I was not apologetic about how much of a fanboy I was there because he, he's really a good dude and he's handling flash. Awesome. Um, I also definitely loved the new daredevil, uh, by Chip Zdarsky, which dropped today. So man without fear pu- catapulted us into this series, which I wasn't sure was going to happen for sure. But now we know for sure, um, that, Man Without Fear literally was bringing us from quote unquote death of Daredevil to this beginning and Chip slayed it. The art in this book is also great. Um, I'm really looking forward to um, I think I've mentioned before Chip is kind of known for being a little more lighthearted um, in a lot of the work that he does. Um, he's done great stuff over on the Spider-Man books that he's writing, but this was a gut puncher and I'm really like, First issue, 
I will not spoil it, but if you are a fan of Daredevil and what Matt Murdock stands for, they're bringing his faith back very early in this book as well. Um, where Matt ended up at the end of the first book made me go, whoa. Um, there's, there's a, yeah, there's a great story going on there. Um, I was going to wait until it was in trade, but you're hurting yeah, my feelings. Yeah, I, I, I will tell you <sighs> off the podcast if you want, so we don't spoil it here. Um, also read Unnatural, uh, the latest installment came out, yeah, found out that one. finally that Unnatural is going to end at 12. So we're at seven, I believe was this week. So that story continues to be amazing. Lots of back and forth. You find out that the main character, Leslie, has some pretty primal, crazy capabilities. And like, this is a book that almost every book, every issue that comes out, you find out something else that makes you go, holy crap. And this this had a couple of those moments in it. So yeah. great, great read. And then my final one that I just want folks to be aware of is uh, I personally, some of my family that I like to see on the road are the folks from Aftershock Comics. And they had a new installment uh, this week called, I think it's called Oberon, um, but it's a fantasy book. And I don't know how else to explain it, um, but there's a girl in reality that um, gets, she trips over a fairy, literally. Um, uh, life-size fairy you know like lord of the rings kind of stuff um and <laughs> he pulls her into their world which is separate from the real world and all that and you find out that she's special for some reason in this entire thing and her parents aren't actually her parents that they've been protecting her and preparing her for something but she doesn't know what and we don't either and that's just kind of the story set up the art is great and I'm like, I'm in. I love it when I'm in on a book from someone like Aftershock because those are passion projects that usually land at their feet and they just want to get it to press. And they did. And so it's like the I, fifth season of True Blood without sexy vampires. That's yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's definitely a book that that's on the level for right now. And then for the same vein, though, uh, Die Number Three came out this week as well. And that just visually is still stunning. And. They fought. They fought a dragon this week, and it was great. Um, they, That's, that'll be that was my film. Yeah. That well. Yeah. Well, it was also that that quote was one of the things I posted to the interwebs today. Is they have this inner monologue of well, they're getting ready to fight this dragon, and the person's like, everybody loves dragons until they have to fight one, and it's like yes, and it's like so true. It's like, that dragon's awesome. It's like, well, you rolled a one. It's like, that dragon's less awesome. Anyway, if you like the fantasy and the D and the D, Die is just continuing to be amazing. That's from Image Comics, and it's worth the trip. So there's just so many great books out right now, and we're really excited about that. But Hector and I also feel that it's time to go with a little more interaction with you and I. And we want to also hear what, you're pulling what you're reading and enjoying so what we'd like to do uh would try this out over the next couple of weeks is join us on the love thy nerd community on facebook just search love thy nerd and tell us what you're reading and why just about every wednesday i make a post in that community on new comic book day that allows folks to share so tell us what you're reading and why that we don't usually talk about and maybe You'll hear your name on this wonderful podcast. We think it'd be great to be able to share in the experience with you guys, find out what you're reading that maybe we're missing. You know, we're not just the sole experts here. We certainly play two guys on a podcast that know a lot about comics, but we know that you guys enjoy different things too. So let's come together. You can join the community and share that to us week to week. And after we list our polls in some future episodes, we'd love to share what you guys think with the community as well. And we don't hate X-Men. No, we really don't. <laughs> but Uncanny Number 11 did drop this week at $8 again, and dang. But, hey, I mean, Cyclops is back, Wolverine's back, the ga- the band's getting back together, and they're going on tour. So it can't be all bad. So tell us why you're reading the books that you're reading, and we'd love to have that conversation and share with our community and get some feedback. So I think that's going to do it for us today on this time. So. That's the Polis Podcast. Episode number nine is in the can. And Hector and I absolutely cannot wait to bring you episode 10 with our first ever interview. We're not saying it's going to be amazing. We're saying it's going to be 
amazing. And it's going to be, uh, I'm just so excited. I'm already losing all my words. So I've got one word for you. No, don't do it. I'm not going to say it. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Yeah, see, <laughs> he's like, I'm not going to do it. Spoilers, folks. Episode 10, be on that lookout for uh, it. We'll tease it as soon as we record it um, because we just don't want to give it up until we know that we've got it in the can and that we're going to be able to share it with you guys. We're excited. So don't forget to like and subscribe and rate the podcast. We love five-star reviews and we'd love if you would share some of those with us. And tell your friends about us too. We'd love, we've been seeing an uptick on people checking us out and we'd love for you to share the joy of comics with each and every one of your friends. I mean, you can find us on just about any place podcasts can be found. You can find us on lovethynerd.com. You can find us on the Book of Faces. We occasionally go to the Twitter. So it's not like we're hard to find. So if you love comics, share the love of comics with your friends. Check out lovethynerd.com and join us in the community. Thanks for listening, everyone. And remember, read Read more more comics. comics. You've been listening to the Pull List Podcast with Chris Poirier and Hector Miron, part of the Love Thy Nerd Podcast Network. Be sure to rate and review the show and share on all the social media.